I'm Mary Parker, and welcome to this episode of Eureka's Sounds of Science. Today I'm joined by Graham Tobin, who earned his PhD in nutritional biochemistry and who spent most of his career in both academic and industry settings, studying and writing about animal nutrition before he retired. He has written several definitive texts on the topic of laboratory animal nutrition, and he joins us today to discuss this important topic. Welcome, Graham. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here and uh, for sharing your expertise with us. So let's uh, dive right in. First of all, can you give us a little bit of background on your research? Uh, My research really was in three phases. Initially, when I was doing my PhD and then subsequently a postdoc in Cambridge, I was focused very much on looking at protein requirements and protein quality. Mm -hmm. And then when I got a lectureship, I moved to Leeds University to the medical school And there I started working on the subject of the regulation of energy balance and its effects on obesity. And in particular, Mm -hmm. I was looking at the role of energy expenditure uh, in energy balance and obesity and using calorimetry as a means of measuring energy expenditure when we overfed animals. Mm. Subsequently, I moved into industry. And my interest really widened into laboratory animal nutrition generally, and particularly into the issue of phytoestrogens um, in in laboratory rodents. So can you give us a little bit of a history of lab animal diets? Does it all parallel research into human diets? It it started off very much like that. Uh, Probably some of the earliest real studies on laboratory animals were carried out in the mid to late 1800s and early 1900s. Mm-hmm. And, and the diets that were primarily used there were what we call purified diets. And that was because these were made of materials that were readily available to investigators even at that time. So there'd be things like casein, starch, sugar, and various oils. Mm -hmm. And and so there are a lot of studies carried out on what we would consider today as being quite advanced diets. The problem was that when you look at many of those studies, what you see is very poor growth and survival Mm. in in rats and in mice. And and we subsequently realized that that was because those diets were almost certainly deficient in vitamins and minerals. And it was about 40 years uh, after that that we started to really understand all of the vitamins that could uh, contribute to a healthy diet for rodents. And consequently, healthy diets for people as well? That's correct, yes. So a lot of the studies that were done with these purified diets were fairly basic, you know, identifying the roles of amino acids, And as we've mentioned, looking at uh, these new substances that were referred to as vitamins and Mm. seeing what effect that they would have on animals. And as you say, later on, looking at how they would impact on humans. So what made these diets um, purified? Like why'd they use that term? They were called purified because they used uh, ingredients such as starch and sucrose and casein Mm -hmm. that were pure largely pure forms of specific nutrients. So, for example, you know, starch was uh, a carbohydrate, casein Mm -hmm. was a protein. So you could create diets that had exact amounts of protein, various carbohydrates, Mm -hmm. just by controlling the amounts of these ingredients in the diet. So if you wanted to have a 10% protein diet and a 20% protein diet. To achieve that, all you would need to do is to use different levels of casein. Okay, that makes sense. So what, in your opinion, are some of the biggest blind spots for researchers when it comes to rat and mouse nutrition? The main blind spots for researchers using diets that I see are, first of all, a lack of knowledge of the diets. Mm -hmm. It's surprising that 
for many investigators for which diet is really important, they have little or no education about laboratory animal nutrition or diets. Mm. And I recall at one particular meeting, one of my colleagues asked 50 study directors from contract research companies, what diet do you use? And I think none of them knew that diet. Hmm. The second issue related to lack of knowledge is that there is very little opportunity for investigators to learn about laboratory animal nutrition and particularly the practical aspects of it. Mm -hmm. Most of that training is probably delivered by inviting specialists from laboratory animal diet companies along to give a talk. And inevitably, and I'm probably no different, those talks will have a bias towards a a commercial uh, viewpoint. A second issue is that there's commonly a very poor approach to good scientific method when using diets in research studies. A very good example of that would be in the use of inappropriate controls. And, and And it's been an issue in the scientific literature for quite a few years now. It's quite common to find investigators using a purified diet as their experimental treatment, but using their standard laboratory diet made of lots of different materials for their control group. If you were to ask these people, what's the difference between a control group and an experimental group? They would tell you that they should be identical except for the variable that you're studying. But if you're using two totally different diets, you're confounding your investigation into the variable by all sorts of other factors. And I suppose a a good analogy of that is that if you try to publish a study Mm -hmm. in which the control group used Sprague Dawley rats and your experimental groups used a Han Wistar, yeah. No referee, no editor <laughs> would accept that for publication. And yet that is equivalent to using a purified experimental diet and a naturally controlled diet. Yeah. Think, what, why so, is that a blind spot? It seems so, it seems like such an obvious thing to think about. Is it just that it's such a mundane detail that it gets overlooked or? It, it's hard to know. Hmm. Because, as you say, it's it's such an obvious flaw yeah. that you would think either institutional bodies would pick it up, certainly you'd expect referees to pick it up, and mm-hmm. editors to pick it up. But just as an example, uh, in, in about 2008, um, a research group reviewed a large number of papers looking at high-fat diets in mice. And of those papers, only 14% definitely had a purified diet as a control and a purified diet as the experimental diet. So that tells you 86% of those studies were deeply flawed. Yeah. The problem is, if, if if you take an extreme viewpoint, when you get a paper like that, where you've used inappropriate control and experimental groups, you really have to discard it. But that would mean an awful lot of the literature would be thrown away. The third issue that I think is a blind spot is there is an innate conservatism uh, amongst many investigators. There is a view that nothing must change especially diet. Mm -hmm. And and that's certainly an issue uh, in long-term toxicology studies where the cost of those studies is so great that it's very hard for a junior individual to say, we should stop using this diet or we should stop using this animal model. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, I think the fourth thing, and it goes back to that survey of study directors, is there seems to be a lack of interest in the diet that's being fed to the animal, Mm -hmm. except from the point of view of, but don't change it. Mm 
<laughs> so as I mentioned earlier, most investigators don't know the diet they use, and their knowledge is so limited that they don't appreciate the possible effect of the nutrients on their diets, but also non-nutrients. We, we touched earlier about mm -hmm. the subject of phytoestrogens. Well, phytoestrogens have quite significant effects on a lot of different studies, particularly those in cancer uh, and in diabetes. Mm -hmm. So that the risk is that if you're feeding a diet and it contains phytoestrogens, that may well have an impact on your research endpoints. And I would imagine that all of this also can affect reproducibility. There are several ways in which diet can affect reproducibility of studies. The first one is a very simple one, and that is very often researchers actually give no information on the diets that they've actually used. Mm -hmm. and, and that's that used to be a problem with laboratory animals, but we've got very much better at being very specific about the nomenclature of the animal model. But still diet there's often not a lot of information there, even to the extent of not even knowing which diets were used. Mm -hmm. The second issue about reproducibility is that investigators will often use the published typical diet analysis produced by man diet manufacturers mm -hmm. for interpretation of their data, rather than measuring the nutrient levels that are critical to their study. Mm. And one has to bear in mind that the diet manufacturer is producing a guideline. They're saying this diet will typically contain about 18% protein. They're not mm -hmm. saying it will contain 18% protein. So if protein is important to you, you really need to measure it. The third issue relates to the formulation type. And very few investigators recognize the significance of variable formula diets versus fixed formula diets. The names that we use there give you a clue. First of all, with a variable formula diet, the manufacturer may be changing the ingredients used in the diet, although that's not very common. Mm -hmm. But more likely, they will be changing the inclusion of the ingredients in the diet. Hmm. With a fixed formula diet, that's very different. Once the formula has been designed, it never changes. It doesn't change from batch to batch, mm -hmm. month to month, or year to year. So the ingredients and their inclusions are always constant. And that's important in terms of being able to interpret when something unusual happens in your experiment. The next aspect is the issue of things that we touched on earlier, the presence of biologically active non-nutrients, such as phytoestrogens, because these can have a big impact on, for example, the development of tumors. Uh, generally speaking, these phytoestrogens tend to inhibit the growth of tumors so if you have diets that have different levels of phytoestrogens, either because you've changed the amount of soybean meal or the soybean meal batches that you've used have got different levels of phytoestrogens, those kind of changes can result in quite significant differences in, for example, the incidence of tumor rates in different groups of animals. What are some solutions that we can pursue to improve research, in your opinion? I'm obviously slightly biased in <laughs> that I think that a better knowledge of nutrition and diet will lead to better research. Certainly, there is a need for much better training at the postgraduate and postdoc level. The big question is, who's going to do it and how are you going to do it? If you rely on people in institutions themselves, the danger is that the young investigators, 
end up not getting training per se, but just instructions on how to perpetuate the same old faults there. Mm -hmm. So that's, a, from my mind, is a very important thing. We've also lost, and, and I, I suppose I'll, I'd be a bit controversial here, but I've noticed over the last 20 to 30 years, many of the laboratory animal science meetings have drifted away from wide coverage of laboratory science to a bottleneck around animal welfare. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not to say animal welfare isn't important. It, it is. But many meetings just became dominated by presentations and posters on animal welfare. And I think the danger was that we lost the link with a lot of the basic sciences that actually lead us to do better studies. One of the things that it's very easy to forget is is perhaps one of the most important contributors to the three R's is actually doing good science. Absolutely. Probably the most dominant aspect of the three R's is just doing good science and getting answers right first time. That's, yeah. that's ultimately it is what can have a major impact on reducing the usage of animals. If we continue to cast doubt on the validity of studies because we don't think those studies have been correctly done, we continue to repeat those studies right. to try to get improvements in technique to get a more reliable answer. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Do you think that was a bit preachy? No, not at all. It, you know, I was actually just going to say the exact same thing before you said it. it. I think that you can sometimes get wrapped up like you said, in making sure mice and rats are as comfortable as possible, which is of course important, but it's equally, if not more important to make sure that you're using as few mice and rats as you can. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the, the fewer you use, obviously the better for, for them and the better for us. Um, and, you know, that involves doing it right the first time. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Graham. This has been incredibly interesting, and I, I hope a lot of people listen to this and, and kind of take it to heart when they're planning their studies. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much indeed for listening. Thank you.